Can we stand, please? Well, there's a pledge of allegiance and I've seen God bless America. Yeah, I was one of our. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Okay, so Stephen, I think Barb has some uh, words of inspiration for us today. Barb, you want the mic? All right, the first one is from Her Majesty, Her Royal Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. It is often the small steps, not the giant leaps, that bring about the most lasting change. And another one from Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Thank you, Barb. I'd like to welcome everybody today on Zoom. James, Ken, Tanya, it's good to see you today. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Walt to introduce our speaker. Yeah, I had the, uh, I had the privilege of uh, working with uh, our guest presenter, uh, Bill Krause, um, who was a uh, patrol officer when I first came on a job in uh, June of 1973. Uh, and later, we both uh, ended our careers working in the criminal investigation division at the Eastern Police Department. And uh, we both retired at about the same time. I, I retired with a little over 30 years. Bill uh, had a little bit, little bit more time uh, than me. But anyway, this is William Krause, and he's going to talk to us about uh, an investigation that he was assigned assigned to uh, while he was in the uh, investigation division. So, Bill, it's all yours. Thank you. And good afternoon. As well said, my name is Bill Krause. I had 32 years with the Eastern Police Department. The majority of it was in patrol. Uh, I was a canine officer. I was a first aid and CPR instructor. And then I went to the uh, narcotics division. I worked as a vice officer. And then I finished up the last 10 years of my career with the uh, criminal investigation division. And, and I, work, I work with Walt. After I retired, I was approached by the chief of police in Wilson Borough, who didn't have an investigator, and asked me if since I was going to retire, if I wanted to come out there, work part-time. And I thought, boy, this would be a great retirement job. You know, little sleepy Wilson Burrow. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I was out there not quite a year. I got called in the middle of the night for a homicide. Yeah. And that's another story. But on this on this story here, like I said, we uh, we I'm going to tell you about this case, this homicide case that they ended up actually writing a, a book about and they also it was it was featured on investigative discovery and some forensic files uh this case involves a lover's triangle three women that turned out to be a, a fatal lover's triangle because they uh the 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 victim uh devin guzman she was found in her car on uh, on June fifteenth, two thousand, uh, she was found dead in her car, and that started basically started the investigation. What we showed in the investigation that it involved Devin, Carrie, and Michelle were the three lovers because uh, Devin and Michelle had gone to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You want me to put your picture up yet or not? Uh, yeah, you can. This was a picture that was in the Express Times the day after this car was found. This car was found with a deceased person in the car. It used to be the Canal Museum on 611 South. And this was in the parking lot. And then this was the start of the investigation. The Easton police received a call that there was a possible DOA in a car at this location. The uniform officers went there, taped it off, started interviewing people that were there, 
and then called for a detective. I was a day shift detective. I was a day shift detective as shown in this photograph. And I was there with my lieutenant of detectives, Steve Barkansky, and the guy who was the a coroner at the time and is still in the car, Zach Lysick. Starting right here, when we looked in the car, we realized that something was wrong. We 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 quickly realized that this was probably a staged scene. One is because the way the body was positioned in the car and the th the throat was cut, but they wherever they killed her at, they put her in the car later and they had the they put her the wrong way in the car. So the first thing upon observation was blood doesn't run uphill. So <laughs> so we knew that was there. The second thing is they we found her work jacket was covering her. Now that led us to believe, you know, most murderers are going to just kill somebody and leave. Whoever took the time to cover her up might have could have been somebody very close to her. And then what happened was when we we, we weren't allowed because it's it's Pennsylvania state law when there's a body found somewhere the coroner has total jurisdiction on it. I as a police officer as a detective I can't do anything with that body. Maybe photograph it, but. I couldn't move the body or do anything else uh, until the coroner does everything. Well, the coroner did his thing. In fact, like I say, this whole investigation was 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 a group effort. There was a lot of search warrants. There was a lot of uh, uh, court orders issued. But like I said, it was a it was a a group effort. And one of the part of the group, which was a big part, was your fellow member here, Walt. Walt did a lot of the photography, came down to the scene, uh, did all the photography. He did a lot of photography throughout the case, and it it proved very influential when we went to court because you can't always recreate, recreate a, a crime scene, but having good photographs that show good detail, and that's, that's what Walt did. Anyway, the, the investigation went on. We learned that there, it, there was a a triangle between Devin, Carrie, and Michelle. In fact, Carrie and Michelle were in the car and found Devin because they had been looking for her. We found out through our investigation that Michelle and Devin were high school students together and then got in, involved uh, in, uh, as, a, as a lovers. But then later on, they broke up. Michelle ended up marrying a, a man named Brandon. But what happened with this case is Devin was going back and forth between Carrie, who she lived with in Forks Township over here, uh, what well, used to be the Mineral Springs Hotel, and and Michelle. Of course, that was causing trouble in in uh, Michelle and Brandon's marriage. Well, one of the things that we did in this investigation, we did what is known as the garbage pool. Now, for those not familiar with that, a garbage pool means that once you people, you put your garbage out to the curb, it's fair thing. Nothing, we, we can, the police can pick your garbage up and it's been challenged. And I know it went as far as the Supreme Court and the, and the Supreme Court made a ruling years ago that said, it's a, you put it out to the curb, it's abandoned property. So luckily through us that's a good investigative tool and one of the detectives ended up pulling a a garbage pool and not only found gauze pads that had a looked like a bite mark on it he also found tickets and 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 some other things indicating that prior to the homicide Michelle and Devin took a trip to the Caribbean islands they actually got married on a beach. They actually bought each other rings, exchanged in a ceremony. And Michelle was kind enough to bill the whole thing to her husband's credit card. <laughs> and she wondered why it was causing trouble in her marriage. But anyway, so then, so then as, as it went on and we interviewed everybody, Brandon, Michelle's husband, 
who we at first didn't suspect because first we thought the uh, the main suspect would be this Carrie because Carrie and Devin had a tumultuous relationship. And like I said, the, police, the Forks police were always at the Middle Springs Hotel. And, and in fact, the lady testified later that, uh, that they had gotten to a fight and tore the place up. But anyway, one of the people we, we in, uh, or interviewed was Brandon, Michelle's husband. Well, what was strange is it was a nice July day, warm. Everybody was wearing T-shirts, and he shows up in a long sleeve sweatshirt. We thought, this is odd. Mm -hmm. Well, it was shortly after that, that in the garbage pool, they found these gauze pads that had what looked like a bite mark on it. So the detective that found them, he went to a forensic dentist, and the dentist says, yeah, that, that looks like it. So that was enough to get a search warrant. They brought Brand Brandon came into the station, and they took pictures of his wound where he was bitten. The, the forensic dentist looked at it again and said, well, I can say almost 100%, but not there. I would need to see whose teeth these were. Well, this happened to be our victim, Devin Guzman. So again, back to court we went. We got a court order. We exhumed a body from where she was buried in Palmer Township, went to the morgue, and the forensic dentist was called in and took an impression of her teeth. Long story short, it it was a perfect match. And with that and a couple other things, we ended up getting an arrest warrant and both Michelle and Brandon were arrested. Carrie, although it'd been a suspect in the beginning, she was cleared and, you know, we were done with her. We went to court after a lot of pre-trial motions. We went to court on September 10th, 2001. We had just picked a jury that morning. We were getting ready there. And I'm sure everybody remembers what happened on September 11th. We all have the, you know, no matter who you are, I think it was certain incidents stay in your mind. And I think everybody here could tell me where they were at on September 11th, 2001. And like I said, I was in the middle of a homicide trial, but fortunately, uh, after a long drawn out trial with a lot of witnesses, in fact, one of the in the later part of it, we actually came up with a, a with a gentleman who testified in the trial that Michelle wanted him to kill Devin and offered him money and sex to do the job. This was months before she was killed, but when he was questioned, and of course the defense attorneys really went all over him, said, "Well, wait a minute." If somebody came to you and said, when he kills somebody, why didn't you report it to the police? He goes, I didn't think she was serious. But then he opens the paper on 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 uh, the 16th of June and sees that Devin was killed. Well, then he came right to the police and, and reported it. But I could say, um, I'm, I'm proud to say it was a group investigation. Uh, we, we convinced the jury that they were guilty. Uh, the, the, the district attorney... One of the things he did, aside from being right on top of everything and, and, and advising us as far as the legal end of it, uh, he decided to try them both together, which turned out to be a smart move. Because if he'd have tried Michelle, she'd have blamed everything on Brandon. And if you tried Brandon, so they're there together, they were there, you know, tried simultaneously. And also, when they were found guilty, they had appealed it numerous times. In fact, they actually, my, my, uh, understanding is they actually had appealed it as far as the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and all the repeals are, were turned down and they are now serving life without parole. There's one more thing I'd like to do here, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, before I conclude here. I'm sure, has anybody here heard of Paul Harvey? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, well known for years, you know, right. Yeah. Good day. That was his thing, you know, and, and the rest of the story, you know, well, he did a thing and this was years ago, but it, it really, you know, makes sense today. I'd like to read one of his speeches about a policeman. <laughs> he said, a policeman is a composite of what all men are, the mingling of saint and sinner, dust and deity. 
Gold statistics wave the fan over the stinkers, underscored the incident of dishonesty and brutality. And we see that on the TV lately. But buried under the fact is less than one half of 1% of policemen misfit their uniform. And that's a better average than you find among clergy. What's a policeman made of? He, of all men, is once the most needed and the most unwanted. He is a strangely nameless creature who is stirred to his face and fuzz, or sometimes worse, to his back. Um, he must be such a diplomat that he can settle a difference between individuals so each one will think he won. But if the policeman is neat, he's conceited. If he's careless, he's a bum. If he's pleasant, he's flirting. If he's not, he's a grouch. He must make an instant decision, and we all know this being police officers, an instant decision which will require months or years for a lawyer to make, you know, the split second of business. But if he hurries, he's careless. If he's deliberate, he's lazy. He must be the first to an accident, infallible with his diagnosis. He must be able to start breathing, stop bleeding, tie sprints, and above all, be sure the victim doesn't go home with a limp or expect to be sued. The police officer must know every gun Draw on the run, hit where it doesn't hurt. He must be able to whip two men twice his size and half his age, or ha half, yeah, half his age, without damaging uniform and out being brutal. If you hit him, he's a coward. If he hits you, he's a bully. A policeman must know everything and not tell. He must know all the sin is, but not partake in it. And a policeman from a single strand of hair must be able to describe the crime, the weapon, the criminal and tell you where the criminal's hiding. But if he catches a criminal, he's lucky. If he doesn't, he's a dunce. If he gets promoted, he has political pull. If he doesn't, he's a dullard. The policeman must change a bum lead to a dead end stakeout 10 nights to tag one witness who saw it happen but refused to remember. And of course, he has to be a the policeman must be a minister, a social worker, a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. And of course, he has to be a genius, for he will have to to be able to feed and raise a family on a policeman's salary. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody have questions for Bill about this case? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I still have time. Oh, I haven't heard the okay. bell ring. What's <laughs> What's the name of the book? Lipstick and Blood, okay. and it's by John Kerry. I know I had one before and then I lent it out to somebody. My wife got me this a while back on Amazon. I don't know if it's still available. And the book would tell you a lot more in detail. Because like I say, there's a lot more that I just you know, didn't have time to do today. Any other questions? What year was that crime? Did you say 2000? 2000. 2000. Yeah, it was... Uh, June 15th, 2000, and like I say, 2001, September, that's when we went to court on it. I would I would say that the description that Paul Harvey had was of Officer Monaghan, if you were still, were you working with Officer Monaghan was in the Eastern Police? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, he, he predates you. It's, it's yes. a long, funny story. Okay. <laughs> well, no other questions then. You're pretty sorry. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did you have jurisdiction to uh, jump in dumpsters? Did I have jurisdiction? To jump in dumpsters. Sure. To, to, to I place. think it would, it's on the same thing as, as a, a garbage put out to the curb. I think we're allowed to go in dumpsters. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure. Because I had occasion to work with the FBI in my career. Oh, OK. And, uh, they went through garbage. They jumped into dumpsters. Basically, nothing stops them. And they were looking for evidence. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether you were. Yeah, no, I've, uh, and I think Walt knows, we both were probably uh, doing our career in dumpsters. We used to call it, we used to call it dumpster diving, dumpster you know. Diving. And and the thing is, like I said, you can, you can definitely find a lot of evidence. Yeah. But I know one time I was dumpster diving and I got home and my wife told me, you're not coming in the house. <laughs> you stink too bad. She made me, she got me clothes and had me go to the station and take a shower. <laughs> yes, it's still available on Amazon. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I wanted to try all this. 
Well, it got postponed. It got postponed on September 11th. And I think we went back a couple months later. And then the trial, I'm, I'm not 100% sure since it's been a while, but I'm saying it was a good probably two months because I believe the prosecution had like 30 some witnesses to put on. And then you had two defendants. You had two attorneys for each defendant. So they all got to do opening statements. They all, all got to do cross-examination. So like I say, it turned out to be a pretty lengthy trial. What was the vote on the jury? As far as I know, it was 12-0 that, you know, for, for conviction. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be. I think it has yeah. to be. Right. Okay. A guy well, called Destiny Long. Yes. Oh, yeah. He was a big, he was a big part of it. He's the one I did the pool. Yeah. I've seen, I think I saw some documentaries. Right. He was in some of them. I was in a couple of them, you know. And then, like I say, the book mentions, you know, everybody that was involved in it. So. That's like a, that was a precedent case. Right? It's a precedent for. I think so. I think so. I'll tell you what, Barry, Barry was a heck of a detective and uh, he was big into forensics mm -hmm. and early on. Now you have that forensic files, you have these 2020 and they show so much about the forensic, but Barry was in it very early. In fact, Barry was involved in a case where a girl was tortured and murdered and dumped in a cemetery. And I'm sure you heard about that. Yeah. Rikeza Williams was her name. Yeah. And yeah. Now you talk about dumpster diving. He did one thing that ended up being worse. After they found the body, and it was in there in the in the summertime in the heat, decaying, he went in and went through everything and found a piece of big red gum. And we knew that one of the suspects chewed big red gum. And fortunately for us, that was one of the three people that were charged with a murder. Fortunately for us, that person had gotten arrested on other charges. So get, Barry got a search warrant, went to the uh, prison with a, with a dentist, and again, bite marks, and got a, a, this, this guy's dent, dentation, or whatever they call it, for, to tell where their, where their teeth were. And he took that to the, the friendly dentist, took this piece of gum that they preserved, and it was a perfect match that the gum that was found in this mausoleum, basically, uh, was a perfect match to the defendant's teeth. In fact, when the attorney saw it, he goes, you know, he says, I, I don't know how I'm going to fight this. And then he ended up trying to make a deal to have his guy, in, in, you know, uh, to testify against the other guys. But like I say, it worked out. It, it, it worked out good, but like I say, yeah, Barry Barry did a heck of a job. One of those guys in that case is still at large, right? Yes, yes. Tommy Henry was with one of them. Yeah, I think uh, that. Corey Mayweather was was another one. Um, I can't remember the name of the third one, but two two of them were two of them. Yeah, one well, one we had right away. One. What 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 island did they get him? The FBI. We worked a lot with the FBI yeah, on that. And, yeah, it's uh, yeah, Quirk. Yeah. What was his first name? What was Quirk's first name? Do you remember? Mike. 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 Yeah. Don't you remember always the badge with the ID? FBI. Mike Quirk. Yeah. Well, he used to answer the phone. Mike Quirk. FBI. You know. But uh, yeah, like I said, the one. They they featured that case on uh, America's Most Wanted for a while when it was on with uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name I can see his face John Walsh yeah yeah and uh, as it turned out uh, like I said to this day they never got the third guy although like I said who knows he might have been killed he might be serving under a different name but I guess Mike Quirk was nicknamed, was nicknamed the Pitbull or something yeah sometimes. Um, some mentoring for our yeah. leave, leave your mic on because Jane has a question for you. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. Hey, Bill, that was a great uh, presentation. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Um, hey, um, in your ten years of criminal investigations, uh, did you have a lot of homicides? Like, how, like how often did you uh, have to? There we go. Actually, when he comes on with his audio, audio is, I've discovered when someone comes on and speaks loud. 
it knocks the camera off. Mm -hmm. Were you able to hear my question? No, do it over. No, can you repeat it, please? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, hey, Bill, it was a great presentation. Thanks for sharing your involvement uh, with that case. And I'm curious, in your 10 years uh, working as a criminal investigator, did you have a lot of homicides that you had to work with? I mean, how, how, how often did something like that come up in your day-to-day? That's hard to say. I and, mean, you know, we had other homicides, but being in Easton was a small department. You know, the detectives, I had to handle anything from like bad checks to homicides and then anything in between. So, but I, uh, I've never really sat down to think about how often, but we had, we had quite a few homicides. And then ironically, when I went to Wilson, where I just said it, I thought it was a nice, quiet thing. I was doing the investigations for eight years there. And in an eight-year period, I had three homicides. And whoever thought it would have them out there. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that sounds like a great career. It, it was. It was always interesting. You never knew what was coming next. And like, uh, like a people have said, police work, which, you know, most people could probably understand, is... 90 90 percent boredom and 10 yeah. percent sheer terror you know one minute you're sitting and having coffee in a donut shop which everybody can relate to and laugh about and that but the next minute like i say you might be involved in a high-speed chase you might be wrestling around with some guy who's high on drugs and has brute strength you might be doing a lot of other things in fact one of my things when i worked a midnight shift i don't remember if i mentioned it or not Aside from doing high speed chases and domestics, I also delivered a baby in the backseat of a car. So that was, you know, kind of kind of different, but it's it's not it's not unusual because it's been done before. So it's gotta feel good putting all that work in and then catching the bad guy and then getting validated when the court system puts them away. That's got that's gotta feel good. It it definitely does. It it feels good. And then it feels even better when they try to pick something apart in the trial that they want to appeal and the higher courts say, no, you were convicted. You were convicted fairly. You had a fair trial and that's it. And like I say, this, uh, th in this case, from what I was told, it went all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and it was like, you did the crime, serve your time. Fascinating. Any other questions? Well, Thank you. I want to just mention one thing. Maybe you remember that a member of our club here was murdered and was never been solved. And that was Charlotte Cazano in Hellertown. She was a realtor. She had a house. Somebody came and killed her in the house. It had never been solved. Remember that? I, I, I remember that. Fimiano, yeah. She was showing a, a property. She was a realtor. And they, she was found dead in it, yeah. Yep. She never, yes. I've never been solved. Nobody's ever come up with any, any kind of a situation here on that. Yeah. Well, I seventy right off I seventy eight. The house was right. Well, like I said, uh, they the state police and some of the bigger departments have, actually have a cold case squad, and and that's the only thing in my career I I regret I never did. I would have loved to work a whole old uh, cold case because you see them on TV, and. And the biggest thing, I've talked to guys from the state police that work cold cases, and a lot of times somebody may be a witness or know something, but because the person, uh, the bad guy, could could intimidate them or threaten them, they won't say anything. But if you go back 20, 30 years later, either the, the guy's in jail or he's you know old and feeble and he can't do anything now the people will talk and that's what they found the biggest thing to solve a cold case but like i said in my own career i'm sorry i never got to do a cold case any, any other, other questions? questions i don't want to hold you people up for meeting well, thanks again it was a great presentation uh we appreciate it thank you, thank you. Questions during lunch? No, yeah. well, it's good to see everybody today thanks for showing up remember no meeting next week uh and get your reservations in for April the 1st, please. Thank you.